Chapter 23 had a large list of organs, each with its own relevant physiology. As usual, I'm not going to review all of that in this video here. You can go back to the lecture videos. Nevertheless, be sure that you do and cover all of the organs that we discussed starting from the oral cavity all the way down to the anus. This will include a large list of proteins that are digestive enzymes, as well as a large list of hormones. There are three major salivary glands, the parotid, the submandibular, and sublingual. These produce watery and mucousy secretions, which help to reduce bacteria growing in the oral cavity. They can do this directly with the action of enzymes such as lysozyme, which can break down cell walls. They also help to wash away bacteria off of the teeth, flushing them down to the stomach where they are destroyed by acid. The teeth, if we zoom in, are composed of three major regions, an outer enamel region, a deeper dentin region, and at the very center, the pulp cavity. Both enamel and dentin share a lot of qualities with bone tissue. However, the enamel was produced by a cell type called ameloblasts, which are no longer present after the tooth erupts from the gums. For this reason, it is very difficult to grow new enamel. A little bit can mineralize on the surface, but that's about it. The ion fluoride helps with this remineralization process. It can also be incorporated into enamel and dentin. And when bacteria try to dissolve the enamel by secreting hydrochloric acid, the fluoride ions neutralize that acid, thereby preventing tooth decay. Two of the major functions of the stomach include storage of food until it is homogenized into chyme, as well as destruction of bacteria through hydrochloric acid and pepsin exposure. The stomach can be removed or bypassed. When this happens, patients must adjust their eating habits as they can no longer eat large meals. They must instead eat a number of very small meals throughout the day. Stomach acid, produced by the parietal cells, is regulated primarily by local production of histamines as well as gastrin, which can come from the stomach or from the duodenum. The use of antihistamines therefore blocks acid production. As a result, when food is ingested, it takes longer for it to be homogenized into chyme and transferred to the duodenum. When food lingers in the stomach, this can often cause an upset stomach feeling. The enzyme pepsin is made in a zymogen form, which means an inactive form. It's important that the chief cells not make pepsin directly, otherwise that pepsin would digest the proteins in the chief cells. Instead, this protein is released in an inactive form, pepsinogen, and not activated until it reaches the lumen of the stomach by hydrochloric acid. The stomach produces a layer of bicarbonate-rich mucus to protect itself from these enzymes and hydrochloric acid. Aspirin, acetylsalicylic acid, can damage the lining of the stomach. Not because it's an acid. It's much less acidic than the hydrochloric acid the stomach makes. But by inhibiting the production of the signaling molecules that trigger mucus production, it allows the stomach acid to damage the epithelium of the stomach lining. The duodenum also has this bicarb-rich mucus protective layer. However, the entire intestinal tract cannot have a thick mucus coating. That's because we need to be able to absorb nutrients and mucus would inhibit that. Therefore, it's important for the acidic chyme coming from the stomach to be neutralized by alkaline juices coming from the pancreas. Because we only release a small amount of chyme past the pyloric sphincter at any time, it's easier for the pancreas to adjust its secretions to match. 
In addition, the liver secretes bile at this location. It can temporarily be stored in the gallbladder or dumped into the duodenum when the hormone CCK is released. The liver has numerous functions. For instance, it's an important regulator of red blood cell breakdown. But the one that we covered in this chapter was the detoxification of harmful chemicals, including medications. The liver makes a large family of enzymes called P450s. These enzymes are promiscuous, which means that they are capable of binding to multiple substrates and altering them, which usually reduces their toxicity. For this reason, it's very dangerous to mix alcohol and other types of drugs, such as opiates. A certain dose of an opiate on its own may be safe, because the liver is capable of breaking some of it down every minute as blood flows to the liver. On the other hand, if you mix this opiate with alcohol, the P450 enzymes will be way too busy breaking down alcohol. Opiates we might measure in the parts per million, but alcohol is in percentage points in the bloodstream. There's just a lot more molecules of ethanol for the P450 to break down, so it effectively ignores the opiate this increases the effective dose of the opiate and can lead to overdose. On the other hand, alcohol can also contraindicate certain medications. The result of this is the opposite. It makes the medications less effective, but the timing here is different. There are a couple of antibiotics, not all, but a few, that you are not supposed to take while drinking alcohol during the same time period. And that's because if you drink alcohol one day, the liver can break it down, but it gets better at doing so. It upregulates the P450 enzymes that can help break down alcohol. When these P450 enzymes aren't doing anything, they can also break down antibiotics, which makes the dose of antibiotic less effective. And for that reason, you're going to have to counsel your patients not to drink alcohol while they are taking their antibiotic regimen. We're not worried about taking these two at the exact same time, the way that we were with alcohol and opiates. This is more around the same day or the same week. So the time frame is completely different here. Don't let that confuse you. The small intestines have large visible folds called the plicae circulares, smaller microscopic folds called villi, and even smaller folds called microvilli found on the surface of the simple columnar epithelial cells. This leads to a huge amount of surface area, which is optimal for absorption of nutrients. Anything that decreases the surface area, such as inflammation caused by celiac disease, can inhibit nutrient absorption and lead to nutritional deficiencies. Prolonged inflammation can further damage the villi, which reduces surface area even more. This picture now looks like the colon, which does not have a lot of surface area. Very little is absorbed in the colon. Water is absorbed here, and that's very important, as well as a few vitamins that are synthesized in the colon by endogenous gut flora. To provide a buffer between these flora and our immune system, the colon has a layer of mucus. These gut flora help to protect us against infections. If we were to get an infection, another defense mechanism is diarrhea. A massive influx of water to the lumen of the intestines can wash out all of the bacteria, both beneficial and harmful. The CFTR protein, the same one that we discussed in the lungs, works in the intestines as well. By transporting chloride ions to the lumen of the intestines, water will follow by osmosis, causing diarrhea. For this reason, people with cystic fibrosis can also have symptoms in their digestive tracts. Cholera can activate CFTR to its fullest amount, causing diarrhea that helps to spread the disease, but can also kill the patient if they do not get fluid replacement. A person who is heterozygous for a CF mutation would only have half the amount of chloride pumped to the lumen of their intestines if they were to get cholera. 
For this reason, it increases their chances of surviving cholera. And this is why we see CF mutations in populations where cholera is endemic, but not elsewhere.